I am uh, nose to the grindstone for the next three months, at least, yeah. to get my PhD back on track. <laughs> right. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually able to do Grim. work on it now that I've wrapped up teaching, but it is so um, intensive, shall we say. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, dear bonus listener, thank you for your patience. It's best I can do, I'm afraid. So, I actually have an introduction to this one. Usually I don't do them for the bonuses, but this one's such fun. Just to say that I'm is here. Dean talking? Because I can't hear him if he is. No, he's currently uh, introducing some chewing noises in the background that I'm going to have to cut out somehow on uh, Audacity. Yeah, right. Yeah, sick. Sorry, I'm hungry. <laughs> Hello, dear listener. Welcome to a bonus episode of Statistically Insignificant. I'm Tess, and I'm here in the head office of the Woke Mind Police planning our next raid on the free thought in universities. Dean and Bart are fumbling with rainbow printed riot gear behind me, and I am arming myself with guns that spit out the flag that says bang, and also the flag that says what are your pronouns. You could kind of have like a specialist ammunition swapper. Oh, sorry, this is a scenario. Sorry, yes. I'm in charge of loading up the uh, Hawkeye arrow quiver. Oh yes, with all the different flags. I've got <laughs> I've got the rainbow flag. <laughs> They've got the trans flag, the bi flag. Yeah, all the different flags. And depending on what kind of uh, reactionary opponent we face, mm. we'll deploy the most efficient ammunition for bonus damage. It's true. I mean, the, the the trans flag is particularly worthwhile at the moment. I'm the person in charge of getting people. The only thing that will actually get you cancelled, which is flying a Palestinian flag. <laughs> That's my job, is tracking down that. That is an incredible new technology we've put together. Keep in mind, what is the Antifa symbol? That's right, flags. <laughs> Ammunition of flags. We are here to... Um, They're not anti-flag. No, we're absolutely not anti Well, we are anti-some flag. Anti-flag, the band, got extremely cancelled, right? So I probably shouldn't keep <laughs> riffing on that. Well, uh. we are also not them. <laughs> Today, we are talking about the latest education fad to take a fundamentally good idea and turn it into an excruciating fig leaf, which is the idea idea of decolonizing academic disciplines. I'm going to be talking specifically about maths and stats, because those are the ones that I am most familiar with, but this has been a long-term project, particularly in social sciences, that started with basically saying, gee, native people sure don't get to write their histories, do they? Mm. And has kind of grown from there. Like so many ideas to come out of criticism of historical structures of power and domination, the political heart has been somewhat removed, particularly by institutions, in favour of aesthetics, so it's more palatable and doesn't actually involve changing any structures. Fanon's Ratchet of the Earth is the first book about like decolonization as a process and the first chapter on it is on violence which says that it can only be secured through violence so no institution can take it on unless it is fundamentally planning on uh completely uh being revolutionized i suppose yeah, i was gonna say i don't think it does rely on violence in a lot of ways like, like, total decolonization, sure, but it's not, you know, a zero-one sort of situation. There are things that could be no, changed certainly. in power structures that don't require that. I'm going to no, come no, out of the I gate don't. with a hot take, uh -huh. which is that the idea of decolonization obviously sounds amazing. When I hear the word, I have an instinctive reaction. Okay. Which is bracing to roll my eyes. <laughs> yes, understandably. I mean, I am aware of this from my uh, study of history, mm. which is that, as Tess pointed out, Native peoples don't re didn't get to actually participate in the creation of that history. Good old postmodernism, neo-Marxist postmodernism, got really involved in exploring history from perspectives we don't usually get to see. And it turns out that a whole bunch of colonial records, they have kind of a bias in them. So you can actually, you know accept decolonial sources into your historical narrative. So that's sort of where I've come to it. I gotta be honest, when you say decolonizing maths and stats, that is the thing that braces me for eye roll. Well, that's what... So, so this actually came up when I was in Auckland recently, because there is a push there to decolonize maths and stats. Like many such efforts at universities, it is something that is top-down, that is, the university administration has decided that it is going to tell its staff to do this, but it is also not going to offer any of the time, resources, or support that might make it possible to do it a proper way. Because one of the things that happens when you say, hey, here is all of this stuff that's not usually taught at universities in these fields, we should introduce it, is that you have people in those fields who weren't taught that stuff at university. For a lot of academics, these are not necessarily things that they are, well, that they have knowledge of in the history of the discipline or are really prepared to talk about, because fundamentally, if you want to do decolonizing properly, it's a political thing. And boy, does the administration not necessarily like you actually doing it like that. Also, doesn't 
When I hear the word decolonizing, I imagine not just the addition of previously excluded voices, mm. but also retracting or reworking, replacing those elements of a discipline that are strictly colonial, the things that are exclusionary, which I can imagine would be quite provocative, especially if yeah. everyone in there has, has taken on those those forms, not necessarily even thinking about ways that they are colonial. Because again, I got to get to the question, I don't know how these things can be colonized. It's Believe a me, we will get to that. It's but a rabbit. Big numerals can't be white. <laughs> to be fair to the argument, I always think of decolonization in terms of things like land and resources and political power and stuff like that. But exactly, yeah. As my partner would point out, though, it's also about ways of seeing. Well, it's not just that, but universities are places of cultural reproduction, and the process of becoming enculturated in a uni. Sorry, I have a cat trying to climb up my leg, and, and the process of becoming culturated in a university is a space where colonized ideas ideas occupy people. And I think Absolutely. that is part of this. That is one of the fundamental things that needs to be addressed. But one of the criticisms of decolonization, particularly in the structure that it is done with regards to like institutions saying, hey, we'll just shove a whole bunch of indigenous knowledge in here, is that actually not everything needs to be thrown out from European history of intellectual development. You know, some of it certainly with great force, but particularly in so stuff like maths and stats, there is useful knowledge knowledge here and it is not necessarily stuff that was developed outside of those disciplines particularly because a whole lot of it is very recent so one of the things that you have to really think about if you are intending to decolonize a subject or a discipline or something is what do native people find useful and you talk to them about this which is one of the things that uh, institutions are very bad at doing and you just say what of this is worth retaining that is particularly hard because you need experts native native people who are experts in those fields in order to really get access to those sorts of things as well. I don't know what your plan is here, but I do not have Bart's grasp of the theory of decolonization, nor your grasp of what actually is maths. The how, good news is, is that... How is maths and stats <laughs> colonized? I, I'm willing to accept that it is, but fuck, I'm, I can't rotate it in my mind yet. So one of the motivations for writing this is the conversation with people in Auckland is basically that they have been told to decolonize maths through, through a capstone subject. I, I don't know what the administration thinks they're going to do with this. Uh, I am going to put forward some ideas for what I think could be included that would be useful. This is not exhaustive because I haven't written the entire subject. So I'm going to give some examples and some framework for how they would operate. So to start with, let's have a think about what decolonization is. But give us, why don't you give us this one, you know. <laughs> it is essentially, comes down to like a broader movement in the mid to late 20th century of the exertion of popular control by people who had been previously under imperial or colonial rule, how that would take shape and in what forms that would take shape. Yeah, so I... It's very relevant to our current condition, in fact. Yes. Yeah, So absolutely. I'm writing here that decolonization is broadly defined a form of resistance to, rather not of, resistance to settler <laughs> colonial or imperial structures, including their removal. Right, so this is not just resistance, but going to the point of defeat. Yes. And dismantling. Yeah, I mean, it's an ongoing process. I don't know if it will ever be complete, but... I think the process itself is quite powerful. So the underlying idea here is that in the process of colonization, in the process of, of exercise of imperial power, there are ways of living and knowledge and cultural practices and things that get destroyed in the places that are colonized. This includes the lives and culture of indigenous people in particular. Various examples of decolonization of practice are things like revitalizing language, returning land and reinstating land care practices, and incorporating indigenous knowledge and history into education. But you could also have things like rebuilding systems of political power. In Indigenous tribes in Australia, for example, there are kind of systems of collections of elders whose decisions are used to guide the behaviour of other people. Mm. So you saw this uh, in the referendum on the, the voice to parliament, for example. Some Indigenous activists came forward and said, look, here is my opinion of what should happen, but I vote in line with what my elders have said, and this is what my elders have said. This is a very radically different 
or not necessarily radically, but quite a different way of viewing power and social relations to what we see in the colonizer state, for example. And as Bart mentioned, there's all of that, but then there is also violent resistance. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I would point out that while Indigenous people are included and like are very important to this process, it also includes people who are Indigenous to their land, but aren't necessarily thought of in the same way, like the Algerian struggle against the French, for example, yeah. is considered a decolonial struggle. But it is just anyone who is land has been occupied and overtaken by settler colonial or imperialist overseas. Like the Jamaican and the French. Yeah, and absolutely. And the Canadian and the French. There's a lot of... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Broadly, this is an anti-French doctrine. <laughs> the Vietnamese and the French. Don't get me started on the fucking Poms, though. Like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as, as the Maori, uh, as the token Maori in this podcast <laughs> who runs it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, also Palestine and Israeli occupation. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this yeah. decolonization is not a finished project. In fact, I would say in many places it has barely begun. And what one of the other th- Canadia. I guess I'll find out when I edit this. Canada. <laughs> Canada. There's your voice uh, voice samples for replacing it. Sure. Listener, if she hasn't edited that out, please go back in your brain and do that yourself. <laughs> Good luck. But another aspect of this can be to take on indigenous worldviews, I suppose is one way of thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. So the Maori worldview, for example, is to adopt those practices and adopt those ideas about relationship to land is a decolonizing process. It this is not just something that involves native people either, because the people who came over here to colonize it, or the descendants of them, are invited to and encouraged to take part of this process as well. The extent to which decolonization should be done is contested. I mean, as I said, there are some useful things that have come from colonization, but native people should be able to choose which of those apply to them as a general principle. Barn me. <laughs> yeah. But as a general principle of, oh no, the cat's trying to play with my headphone cable, of like self-determination. Native people should get to choose what of these things they see as useful and have rights around that sort of thing. And they should be able to say to people who have colonized their areas or the, or, or the settler culture, I suppose, hey, here are some things that you could find quite useful. Particularly Maori worldview is, is kind of interesting in that regard because there is an an invitation to to non-Maori people to learn about and adopt the Maori worldview as a way of not fucking up our environment more than we already have. Kind of whips, to be honest. Like. Yeah. So I want to talk about, uh, first off, a couple of good and bad reasons to do decolonial stuff or decolonization stuff, because I think there are good and bad reasons to it. The good... Um, is- my hand is hovering over the big complain button. I don't <laughs> How is maths and stats? I can imagine uses of math, mathematics and statistics for colonial ends. We'll get there. How is the discipline of mathematics and statistics colonial? We'll you, get there. You're really I'm tra- teasing you. You're teasing <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm getting <He's>... blue brained. <laughs> So, good reasons to do it are because you recognize the value of indigenous culture, you want indigenous people to have power over their lives and self-determination, and a recognition of the great historical wrongs that were done to indigenous people or other people subjected to these imperial powers. And present wrongs. And present wrongs, yes. The bad reasons are because you are a university administrator who has decided that this is a great way to boost the image of the institution. So you're going to tell people to do it and then kind of wash your hands and say, look, we're telling our people to do it. Honestly, the university as an institution is kind of like a colonial Right, one, exactly. Right? In yes. all of these settler colonies. Like, um... That's what I that's was saying. Like, decolonize that fucking university administration. <laughs> for oh, I have plans. Don't worry. So one of the reasons- oh, that... you bought that fertilizer? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're not- just say that on it on recording (laughs) please azo already has the track i suppose so you know one of the reasons that this is difficult in universities is because teaching is already grossly under-resourced in in the sense that there are not enough people paid enough to do the teaching that currently exists and rewriting subjects or writing material for subjects to include this takes a lot of work and a lot of collaboration between experts in the field who are developing the, the course material even historians and native people who know what actually has gone on and can think about what should be changed. One of the biggest barriers to this is that universities are more than happy to tell teaching staff they have to do it, but none of them are ever really willing to front up the the resources to make it possible. Well, most of what academics do is thinking. Yes. So they can decolonize just by thinking (laughs) better. 
Uh-huh. And if they think the fuck you're talking about, can't better gooder, uh-huh. then it'll be very cheap to decolonize. Well, it's true that the liberals do tend to occupy the upper echelons of universities, and this kind of brain cancer does proliferate among them. That's right. So it should actually be quite cheap to do, is what I'm I'm saying. In mm-hmm. contrast, is that we find the bits of each number. <laughs> That, that are, are racist, yep. <laughs> and we can like them out, yeah. uh, the little bit on the four that sticks out to the side, it's uh-huh. not necessary. We could just make it a U with a little leg. That little bit, that's the colonial bit. So we'll take that one off. Mm-hmm. The top of the seven, unnecessary. You could probably do away with like the top of the eight if you just had a little teardrop shape. That's a gamma though. Okay, well, we're talking about real numbers, fucking nerd. <laughs> uh, half of the nine... Which half? Vertical. But that's a zero. Listen, we're dealing with a lot of complex they, they adjustments said they're real, though. that we're going to have to make. I hope somebody in the audience gets that joke because Dane clearly did not. Uh, oh, <laughs> yes. Some, some, of the, <laughs> yeah, some, of, some numbers are real. Yes. <laughs> I mean, look, real numbers are also complex. It's going to be difficult, but the administration is willing to make these changes once we identify whatever parts of the numbers are colonial, we're just going to have to adjust. Okay. We could invent new symbols to take up the missing space to continue to differentiate. Oh, I've got it. We could take all the colonial bits of maths and stats, remove them, and then put new bits in that are on the blockchain. The blockchain is a colonial And then we there. AI enable analysis of all new material to make sure this doesn't get included again. Speaking of brain cancer, my headache is increasing already listening <laughs> to anything about this. All right. Yeah. Fine. Stop, stop. Goof it off. So this is primarily going to be about how statistics has been used as a tool of colonization. But first, I want to talk about the enlightenment and kind of the logic of measurement in imperial projects. Because fundamentally, the demand to measure everything... Demand to measure everything itself is quite cruel because it doesn't actually matter how big some things are. It's more about how they're used, you know? Uh-huh. And decolonize your tools, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the demand to measure everything came from a combination of, like, scientific, that is, empirical ideals and the growing need for capital and the state to know what's happening. Scholars talk about making things visible to the state, and measurement is a really key part of that process. Mm. I'm far more on comfortable ground with this sort of stuff. I've read The Logic of Elimination. It was quite illuminating as a, as a text. I'm very aware of the way numbers can be used for colonial ends. I guess I struggle to connect that with the decolonizing of the study of Yeah, so what, what I'm itself. imagining, how I would teach this, is that I would have a subject where you address these historical situations, you address the ideological constructions... Yeah, Like, this is the, where does this stuff come from in the empiricism and the positivist models that kind of built science as we know it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I would talk about eugenics. And in fact, we already have an episode on eugenics. It's episode 26. And you can listen to me rant about that history and statistics if you want to. But that's a huge part of this. Because- You'll never guess which side she's on. <laughs> it's not the one you think. This idea of using numbers to abstract away from the material situation to something that can be more easily handled by the state is absolutely central to the process of colonization because there is so much distance between the imperial core and the actual material things that they are exercising power over. Absolutely, yes. You need a, you need admi- administrative state to not only manage the process but also to dehumanize the people involved in it and and a lot of numerical constructions are part of the tools that you use to do this so this is kind of an implementation of a system of knowledge as part of the colonization process and teaching people that for one that happened Two, how it happened, and three, the ongoing effects of that and the ongoing structures of the state that still rely on those things, and in no small part as a result of that, lead to horrific things happening to people, even people who aren't native. Yeah, I suppose what you would be moving towards is a kind of Hippocratic oath for statisticians. I Um, swear not to use my power for for dark purpose. (laughs) Because because oh, otherwise no, you I, can't do that, or else well, I, one thing, he's going to drill the oil and shit, mate. These universities <laughs> exist to like. I, a... I, I, no, I don't. I don't think that that sort. I of get a, you, Bart. I, I don't think that that sort of a structure is useful or really implementable. Because because like in my undergraduate statistics and maths, right, we didn't do this stuff. I know about it because I'm a fucking nerd who had already done a degree, mm. and I have political interest in doing so. So I talk to people about this stuff in their undergraduate classes particularly about stuff like the eugenics history of statistics because otherwise they don't see it and that is something that needs to change what they do with that knowledge i cannot control directly but i believe that the people the students that i talk to are not well 
a couple of students that I have taught are clearly um, of dubious ethical intent, but most of them want to be good people who do good in the world. As do most people. Yeah, so I think that the aim with this is to show people how colonization logics have used maths and stats, to show them how they can choose to do otherwise, and also teach them some of the ways that those same tools often exactly the same tools, have been used to resist colonization. I would interpret that as adding a sociological element to the teaching of statistics, which makes sense because... I mean, you as, can't avoid it. Yeah, as is our as our motto here, statistics are political. Yes. So you would be you'd be addressing that within the coursework. Yeah, but also in this context, kind of statistics is the maths, right? Because it is... An yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Right? In the context of the maths itself, you can talk a lot about how actually it's not just the Europeans who were doing maths. You basically have a whole host of historical examples where Europeans were not the first people to do things. As I said, as a, as a throwaway gag, we're not using fucking British numerals. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. Part of this is talking about those historical cases yeah. and where that sort of stuff developed. I, I I don't think Dean was here for this one, but when we talked about tracking fish numbers and stuff, uh, we had early examples of incredible engineering feats in Hawaii of how how fish numbers were tracked and that sort of thing. Like, yeah, right. a lot of this stuff has been developed by people for a long time, yeah. mm-hmm. and the history of the development of counting is genuinely really interesting because everybody needs fundamentally to track stuff about what how much food they have and those sorts of things and when they need to be in what location and how that quantitative information is learned and retained is genuinely really interesting to me. Okay, I think I have rotated this in my mind enough that I now grasp it and (laughs) I want to I I think it's important because I have now decolonized my brain a little because there is a part of me that wants to say, okay this is all important knowledge and stuff that statisticians should probably know. And mathematicians. But my brain says this is not itself related to the discipline of mathematics and statistics. Yeah. I think that that itself is probably a, a, would we we call that a a colonial bias? or Yeah, absolutely, because it attempts to separate the discipline of mathematics from the way that maths is used in the world. Okay, that's fair enough. And I suppose that the abstraction of the numbers away from what they influence is is so, that's that's all we talk about on this show. Yes. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So I suppose that if I open my heart (laughs) to those concepts... I have a scalpel somewhere. We could get started. What 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 (laughs) I'm saying is, is that my resistance, or at least my uncomprehension for the episode up until this point, fades if I accept that these things are in fact uh, important parts of the process of teaching mathematics mm. then I no longer am trying to to square it with this fundamental concept there is no pure exercise of mathematics yeah, I yeah. should say yeah maths is a social process yes yeah. and I'd also say that like all these universities right the STEM departments were like for a long time their major function was to go produce weapons to do imperialist yeah, wars yeah. some sort of like decolonization of- or produce racist science yes. yeah no 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 for sure but like even into like deep, deep into the 20th century, that was the major fa- function of STEM departments. Oh, it still is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, we're alumni of University of Wollongong. We absolutely fucking are aware so, of that. So uh, the University of Wollongong was apparently collaborating with a weapons manufacturer at one point with this engineering department. Beautiful. Hell yeah. I don't know if that is still the case. It would not surprise me if that was still the case. It was quite the... Uh... Scandal. Yeah, there were protests, student protests about it. Those bloody students protest about anything, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> if we're lucky. <laughs> so fundamentally what I want to see in maths and stats is a recognition of where mathematical knowledge has developed that is not North America and Europe. This isn't even hard. There are so many examples of really, really useful, interesting things. Even calculus, which was nominally invented by Newton and Leibniz in Europe. There is evidence that about 300 years before, Indian mathematicians were using those exact techniques. They just didn't do it the same language or the same location. It didn't seem to stick around in their theory. Yeah. Well, they correctly intuited that it was fucking annoying. (laughs) (laughs) They were much smarter than fucking Newton. Finding examples across history where other people have done interesting things is very is kind of the easy example and is in many respects the one that the university is kind of in favour of because it's not really a political project to point at some brown people and say, look, they had good ideas too. Sure, yeah. The yeah, rest it was- of it, the ideology behind quantification of stuff, the implementation of measurement systems on human populations, the history of statistics and the state and eugenics and all these other things, they are the spicy political material that university administrators are not necessarily fond of us talking about. Yeah, imagine asking your staff to decolonize and then they go and like... Um, actually do it? Yeah, they actually go and <laughs> kick out the weapons manufacturer from... Well, I think, hey, <laughs> listen, we told 
you to do the buzzword? Why are you doing politics? <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is one of my my fundamental complaints about the idea of decolonization as it is practiced in these institutions is that it becomes a fig leaf of we'll talk about some brown people from time to time and what they did. Yeah, and they definitely won't fucking fund another subject which is like a, a sociology slash maths fusion to... Oh god, I would love... I, one day, my dream, one of my dreams is to write that uh, and teach that subject. I, I would love to, I would actually like to attend it. I'll, <laughs> I would go back to uni for that class. That sounds fun. The good news is because I am uh, anti- uh, fees in university you can just walk in fantastic i mean i have spoken to, to the maths and stats school at wollongong about the history of eugenics and statistics as well so some of the undergraduates have been exposed to my radicalism you heard it she confessed it wrap it up Bart. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> we got her. If, if universities want to decolonize they could keep still being weapons manufacturers but they should give them weapons to <laughs> aboriginal and maori groups like that, that would be <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the warriors of the aboriginal resistance absolutely yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uowa to Gaza. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I want to talk about a bunch of examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but I think that they are interesting. I have already mentioned the idea that there were people who were not Europeans doing math stuff. That's a really, really interesting example, and I think you would kind of lead with that, and then you can ask interesting historiographical questions like, why do we not know about this stuff? Why are you not taught it in schools? Why do we not think about it outside of this particular subject? Maths is a little better, I think, at pointing at people in history if they are known, but there are, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we don't know just because it's been lost to history. Or because in the process of, for example, colonizing India, a lot of stuff got destroyed. Let's go into the spicy list, political examples that I would do. I was wondering why there's a whole bunch of capsaces on this paper. I'm crying. <laughs> so the first thing I want to talk about is census. No, we already did this episode. Sorry. Surveys. <laughs> we could just splice in uh, a different episode here and save time. This was, I think, our third episode yeah, was yeah. about the census. And mm -hmm. mostly I'm just going to point back to that and say, go have a listen. It's a lot more in depth than I'm going to be. But what I will say is that the census is a way of the state knowing about people. And boy, Boy, does that have a long history in colonized societies as a tool of control over the colonized population. I think Rome had census censuses, censes? No, it's census, that's right. Uh, in colonized- Yeah, that's like the word we use for it. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. I know. Census being the plural. Yeah, it's in the Bible. That's why uh, fucking Mary and Joseph had to go back to Nazareth. Yeah. And this was a way of them basically working out how much they could extract from colonies and tax. Yeah. Just imagine them all sitting around, the three wise men are like, wait, do we count? Do we have to yeah. <laughs> put ourselves here? Oh, do we count as in this household? What's our, what's yeah. our, what's our income? Yeah. Just remember, sorry, I, I like that in the Roman Empire, the entire empire was about like extracting tax from everywhere else. But in the like capitalist empires, what it is is the taxpayer funds the military invasion and then the rich people get all the resources and none of the people who paid that tax actually got the shit. Yeah. We're at a much more advanced uh, age now. Capitalism Watching has Bart done <laughs> leaps and bounds. Watching Bart real time turn into a, like a marble statue guy. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's, re let's return. It's like, damn, <laughs> we have to, he's slowly replacing his U's with yeah. V's. So in Australia, we have an interesting history of this as well, because the 1967 referendum here had two parts, one of which was basically including indigenous people in the census. So they were counted as part of the Australian population for the purpose of census measurement. And listen, if you didn't know that we didn't do that until 1976, congratulations. Because 67. Yeah. Fuck. Yep. One of the very few, like, referendums that actually passed, by the way. Like, very impressive. Uh, yes, and 90% people voted those yes. Those things are designed to fucking fail. Another thing that was a, a form of resistance against this was a couple of, um, I, I suppose they would have been Indian at the time, a couple of Indian people living in the Bengal during the Bengali famine, which is in the late Victorian era, actually decided to go and do a survey, a, a census if they could, of who was dying in in the famine. So they basically went around to all of these villages and asked the wasted survivors of the ongoing famine, how many people do you know who have died and who were they? And this was a... Whoop! Cat arrived. Thank you, Dean. Cat moment. And this... That was Erwin, incidentally, for those keeping score. This data set is something they actually took to the British Parliament as part of an effort to stop Britain extracting food from Bengal while everybody was fucking starving. Which I assume worked. Yes and no, they got more 
popular support, right. um, even from among lords and things. But I don't believe that was what really ended the famine at the time. Right. And uh, if you want more on that horrific history, read Late Victorian Holocausts. You will never stop wanting to cave the head in of a British monarch. So the next thing I want to talk about is... Blood. Sorry, before we move on, can't spell census without sus. I've been holding on to that one. <laughs> I really had to get it out. Can't spell it. It's right there. The next one I want to talk about is Blood Quantum. Please acknowledge just once. Hang on, Blood Quantum? I thought we were doing stats, not physics. Again, she's just giving me this this brutal deadpan. Work with me. Yes, and. Yes, and. So Blood Quantum, we actually have an episode on this as well. I talked to a Maori guy, Liam Stevens, and we talked about how Blood Quantum has been used over time to... Well, it was implemented to quote-unquote measure race, the idea being that your racial composition was determined proportionally by your ancestry. Uh, Because, of course, these things are clearly defined. If you had one white parent and one Maori parent, you were half Maori. Blood quantum has been used in settler colonial stuff in order to minimize the number of native people, but also to maximize the number of slaves. So one of the classic examples in the US were one-drop laws, which meant that if you had one drop of black blood, that is, one known black ancestor, you were born a slave. Whereas if you were native and had one drop of white blood, you didn't count anymore. So in the US and Australia, New Zealand and Canada, this was used as a tool for the state to consider people to no longer be indigenous, or at least the kids of people who were indigenous would no longer consider indigenous. So this led to the forced removal of children and people being dispossessed of land that their parents were considered valid to own, but they were not. In particular, blood quantum is in direct opposition as a way of measuring, quote unquote, heritage to a lot of the ways that indigenous people think about ancestry. The example, or the counter example, being whakapapa in Maori culture, which is a way of tracking your background that is, I guess, additive rather than proportional. I am Maori because I have at least one Maori ancestor. Anybody who has at least one Maori ancestor is Maori and is invited to pick up on and run with that particular cultural connection. Play the fucking Uno reverse card. (laughs) Well, no, this has been great because as a different way of measuring, quote unquote, identity and culture, this means that the population of Maori people in New Zealand is expanding. Whereas the logic of colonization says that as Maori blood gets diluted under this idea of blood quantum, Maori people and Maori culture would die out. You get a lot of um, absolute shitheads now saying that they need to end the co-governance rule in New Zealand. So this was a a particular group of shitheads who, because New Zealand has decided to um, try out the spicy racists for a term of their electoral system, hold more power than is comfortable for most people. This stuff still shapes race relations today. I mean, you can see it in the resistance to it for native people, but also in the US, who is black, or rather who has blackness imposed on them, is very much based on this idea that if you have a little bit of blackness in your history, you are black. I mean, this is why Barack Obama was a black president. Yeah. His mother was white, but he had more than zero amount of black heritage, so he was a black guy. One of the things that ties into this as well is population dynamics. So the idea that native people would die out as a result of blood quantum is a question of quantitative population dynamics. The idea being that the population of native people would go to, to zero as they got bred out. You also see... As among other incidental activities that were taken. <laughs> yes. You also see this idea in the white supremacist bullshit around the Great Replacement. So even now, the idea that brown people are going to outbreed us or otherwise replace us as white people, that is a notion of population dynamics that is built from this blood quantum framework of measurement. It's always very interesting, the Great Replacement, which is that they'll replace all the white people with brown people, but then all of a sudden ideas of nationalism fall away and reveal themselves to be what they always were, which is white supremacist bullshit. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's not, it's not not all nationalism, but in Australia, it's often the case. Okay, well, if you take the term nation-state, right, state is uh, the functioning of, like, a government usually has to do with the monopoly on violence but also like in any modern era is comes with a whole bunch of much better stuff than that yeah, but yeah. nation pertains to a people and that is a problem mm. the next one i want to talk about is basically measurement of land so land surveying specifically so i got into an argument recently with somebody who said that the nazis were socialist because there's socialist in the name 
which is ridiculous on the face of it. But that little national in the front of socialist, it's not just a little adjective there. There's some quite interesting functional meaning to what happens when you take socialism and then say, it, but it's national. Yeah. Who gets to count as human? Also, like, the Australian Labor Party is not great on Labor, so I don't, I don't understand why people <laughs> are true. so confused about this. Mm. And the Democratic People's Republic in North Korea, look, if nominative determinism was a thing, Heroes, we would see, champions uh, of the working class. <laughs> precisely, precisely. So land surveying is the over Overlap between geography and measurement, because it is the way of understanding geography through measurement. It's part of the quantitative analysis of land and resources, typically for imperial ends, and partitioning of land for colonizers or settlers is a huge part of that, because you have to determine where the new boundaries of this settler's land are going to be, and that's typically done through surveying. Which is a nerdy maths thing. Yeah, I mean, it uses a lot of geometry. I think I remember doing that in high school. I think that may have been the subject where my eyes just glowed. Over, <laughs> and I was done. Is that the one we have to mm, do like topographic maps and stuff like that? Topographic, topographic, like the raises yeah. in the land and shit like that. So cartography Terrible. is part of this. Oh yeah. Now that was geography, but paid so little attention he forgot what class he was in. <laughs> I mean, it's all geography when one. you're in high school. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. No, no, I meant like fucking the bit where they give you an irregular shape and you have a fucking equation to get the area. Oh, so the geom- geometry in math. Yeah, yeah. So similar ideas do show up. I mean, trigonometry use of triangles is huge in surveying because that's one of the ways that you measure things from a distance. And it's gone woke. Yes, because <laughs> it's triggered. Ah, uh, Tesla! Tesla! Everyone! I, I laugh in confusion because it's yes, strange. yes. She has been giving me a stone wall this entire time. That one got a smirk. Oh, I'm riding high. Please go. I on, feel bro. like no one's used triggered except stand up special titles since like 2014. But oh, I wanted my turn. <laughs> <laughs> But you used it wokely, so it doesn't count. So the next one on my list is if modern you say surveillance. say the slur ironically, it's fine. That's the official position of this <laughs> podcast, by the way. Go on then. Idea. Data-driven, often highly statistics-based modern surveillance systems are, uh, shall we say, selectively used against indigenous populations, particularly those resisting colonizing rule. You just have to look at Israeli's tech sector and the abundance of tools that they build, use against Palestinians, and then sell ev- everywhere else in the world in order to see this in action. you got to imagine some of the people who bought some of that on October 7th were doing the, the collar-pulling emote. I think that the people who bought this stuff were not at all doing the collar-pulling emote. No, 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 I didn't mean i didn't mean that like they were worried about what they were supporting uh, when they saw the aftermath i mean like shit this stuff was supposed to keep people out oh yes the the ineffectiveness right yeah. exactly well no joke that has been a big um scandal in israel is just how did these um presumed backwards people, according to Israeli logic, managed to pull this off. Mm. We have such high-tech and perfect surveillance of them. How could this have happened? Has anyone done the the Tony Stark built this in a cave (laughs) with a box of scraps? Has anyone put that together yet? Yes. Oh, shit. The next one on my list is quote-unquote AI, and we have a previous bonus episode about why those quotation marks are there, so I can also just call this as algorithmically driven modelling. Almost all AI projects are basically ways of, of reinforcing imperial control, at least the way that they are used on people. I mean, there are research cases which are not that, but... What what are they doing right now? They're trying to use AI to determine why, quote-unquote, kids are anti-Semitic. Yeah. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it is just about, like... Land reform is the is the number one enemy. So like a modern surveillance system, this sort of algorithmically driven modeling and algorithmically driven tools, where they are used to make decisions about people, they typically make decisions about already marginalized people first. So you can see this in efforts to like remove supports in the welfare state through having AI implemented ways of kicking people off welfare and these sorts of things, which is deeply tied into colonization because a lot of indigenous people wind up surviving, if you can call it that, on welfare as a result of their colonization. There are some ex- examples of resistance. Tehiku Media's large language model is a rare case. So this is a Maori language uh, large language model. It was built by Maori people for Maori people as a language preservation tool. So in this instance, they have very, very specifically and intentionally used this instrument, this AI model, large language model, in order to help with decolonization through the revival of the Maori language. 
change. And that is a tool of decolonization there. It is very heartening to see someone take these technological forms and put them towards something that is unambiguously good. Yeah. Because in addition to the fact that all the things that modern technocracy is doing that are fucking wretched, it also sucks that we have a modern technocracy and it's not doing anything good. <laughs> <laughs> or very few things by, by force. Like, it's it's just disappointing. Yeah. I mean, it kind of fucking rocks that, like, I don't know, 60 years ago, like, the smartest, like, mathematicians and stuff would have been working on, like, new fertilizers and getting people to the moon and shit like that. And now they're all working yeah. on, like, new ways to advertise. I will counteract that slightly and say that I have been looking at postdoctoral jobs because uh, my PhD funding runs out yeah. next year. And there are still a lot of stuff doing things like trying to develop new crops and things like sure, that. Yeah. So, you know, that research hasn't gone away. It's just that there's much less money being thrown at it in proportional to the fucking bullshit. It yeah, is, of course, it, yeah. That, yeah. But it's entirely right, though. The outlook 60 years ago... Was much more optimistic than now, yeah. yes, I agree. And far more focused on the idea of society as something that was to be built... Yes. And continually built. I'm not trying to romanticise the past and certainly not what we might call the ideological underpinnings of the 1960s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But certainly there did seem to be a, a little bit more fucking going on like <laughs> culturally in terms of Well, what I will say culture. is that we have an up- upcoming episode later this month, because I'm recording this on the 1st of December, about mutual aid as a different framework to think about these things. And I think there we can really dig into that idea. The third of them, in fact. Mm -hmm. If you are listening to this and you have been asked to decolonize your statistics or maths and something, here is a rough list of the things that I would include. First of all, maths didn't start in the Enlightenment. Yeah, I had a bunch of, um, when I was doing my history, had like a libertarian guy who was in a lot of my classes and he really didn't like learning about the Islamic Golden Age and how much of European knowledge was <laughs> was safeguarded by them while we were fucking rolling around in shit. <laughs> yeah, so this is basically the... By UK- we, I mean... You know, white people. You're, you're Danish. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is where you incorporate other examples of historical development of maths, but this is also like where you can talk about how the structures of those societies were actually influential in supporting that sort of thing. Because a lot of those societies had much better support for, I guess, intellectual research than, say, Australia does at the moment. I would also add their native or, well, I suppose indigenous, depending on what terminology you want to use. First Nations, uh, it's all good. Yep, yeah, mathematics. Gonna... Examples of this sort of thing are that people in the Pacific had to be astonishingly good at astronomy in order to navigate, and that requires a lot of maths. Also, the use of measurement as a political tool. See this goes... any other episode of this Well, podcast. no, see this episode as well, because most of what I've been talking about is that, precisely, yeah, yeah. from both directions. I mean, I've told you about uses of measurement as a tool for colonization, but also uses of measurement as a tool to resist colonization. And both of those matter, because part of doing decolonization in a rigorous fashion is to say, actually, indigenous people have used this stuff as well, to their own advantage and by their own choice. And that needs to be incorporated and acknowledged. I think that is everything I have for today. Thank you too for listening to me and thank you for subscribing to our podcast. Encourage your friends to do it. Bully them if you must. Steal their credit cards and sign them up to the Patreon. Kill them. No, then they won't listen. (laughs) And they, then, once they're signed up, kill them. Then they can't unsubscribe. <laughs> this is the official doctrinal advice. <laughs> but no, no. If if they're dead, their credit cards will. What you're going to do is do identity fraud on all your friends and get them signed up to yeah, the exactly. Patreon. Identity fraud your friends, or just kill someone. Goodbye. <laughs> and also, dear listener, please follow me on Letterbox. I like writing about movies, and no one follows me there, and it's so much fun. All right, I'll see you later. Have a good one.